Tarlhurst End podcast. Read the blog on thetarlhurstend.com. Well, I'm delighted to say this week on the Tyler Sim podcast to celebrate the Christmas spirit, delivered a bit of a present for our listeners. I'm delighted to join a real, true Royals legend, one Shaka Hislop. Shaka, thanks very much for taking the time to join us. You're very welcome, Dan. Anytime. How are you doing? Doing very well, thank you. Whereabouts are you based now exactly? Because obviously, you, there's a. I knew there was a five-hour time difference, but I didn't know exactly where you are at the moment. I'm I'm in Boston. I'm I'm in the U.S. I've been I've been in the U.S. since 2006. And finally settled in up in uh, up in the northeast, up in Boston. Very, very nice indeed. I'm sure it's a bit nicer than Reading at the moment, which is cold and miserable, as I'm uh, sure you'll well remember. It's it's pretty cold and miserable here too. <laughs> bit Christmassy though. Have you had any snow yet this year? No, thank goodness, not not just yet. No, no, we're still uh, waiting for some of the white stuff here. Not just uh, just the traditional rain in Berkshire, but uh, <laughs> oh well, we just have to deal with it. So. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot about your time at Reading, but let's go back to the very start. What is your earliest footballing memory, and was football always the goal for you? Uh, well, it, my earliest footballing memory, just playing in, in Toronto, Tobago with, with my dad and then you know, my, my brothers and then friends is, and growing up. Um, it was just a, a, a game I loved that you know all my friends played, and um, so as a result, so did I. And so as I got older, I realised I was... A little bit better than them, and and eventually making some of the junior national teams in Tran to bigger growing up. Um, but you know, I, at the time, and and you know, kind of dating myself here, there weren't a lot of options in terms of a future in in the sport. Certainly not with not within Tran to bigger. Um, I got to I got to graduating high school back in in 1987, and pretty much the only option available to me then was to pursue a soccer scholarship in in the U.S. Which is which is exactly what it did. I was going to say you didn't come through a traditional sort of youth system. There was no sort of academy set up or anything like that. How did that transpire? How did you go from playing college football in the states to getting a getting a trial and getting spotted by Reading? Well, I was, I was well, as Reddy says, so I was playing. You know, I played my my, my time out in, in the states, and then um, you know, as, as I was nearing graduation, I kind of trying to decide what to do. I was born in England, so so had, had a uh, British passport and um, was, was looking at options and I wanted to give I wanted to give football a try uh, if it didn't work out well so be it um, and as things happened I was drafted by the Baltimore Blast which was an indoor team in, in the US and I went to school in Washington DC and Baltimore was 45 minutes out, outside of outside of Washington DC in, in, in Maryland there, there was no MLS at the time. This is back in 1992. There was no MLS. There was no professional league, even in the, in the US, for for me to to, to think of as as the next stepping stone. I was drafted by by this indoor team, as as I say, without any real um, any real ambition to play to play indoor. And as as it happens, and, and you talk about you know lucky coincidences, Kenny Cooper Senior, former Manchester United goalkeeper, was was actually the coach of the Baltimore Blast. And they just, again, lucky coincidence, happened to be touring England that summer. That would have been summer of 1992. They played a couple of exhibition games against Aston Villa up in Birmingham. Dwight York had joined Aston Villa the year before. Uh, the regular starting goalkeeper for the Baltimore Blast, he couldn't make the trip. So I, I played both games. And again, just by good fortune, there was a Reading scout in... in um, in the stands for one of the games that I, I won, I won MVP of the game for. A Reading scout was there, and uh, Reading contacted me and, and offered me a trial. I was going to say, were there any other clubs interested? You did Villa show any interest, or do you have any whispers no, of not, other interest? No, not as far as I'm aware. As far <laughs> as I, I, I knew, I heard that Reading were, were interested, and um, and and I, I hadn't heard anything else. And and that you know that was fine with me, you know, and not that I knew much about Reading as a club before before arriving um, on, on trial in, in the summer of, of 92. Um, but, you know, it, it was it was a real and, and it was a real option and, and one that, you know, certainly I was more than willing to, to take a stab at. 
I was going to say, I mean, it wasn't the most glamorous of clubs at the time. We were in the third tier playing at Elm Park, which, you know, I've got great memories of. But it, let's, let's be honest, it was rusty. It was falling apart at the time. Um, so not the most glamorous of settings to come to. Was it hard to give up your life in the States and move all the way back over to England? Uh, it, it was hard from a, a, a social perspective. You know, my friends and my family had left my, my, my girlfriend in, in the U.S., Thankfully, she's she's now my wife, um, so at least I was able to to keep that intact. <laughs> um, but in in terms of in terms of the facilities, and and this is a you know a, a perception I, I think that that people have about Reading at the time, or say or any lower league club. Now again, remember my upbringing in the game. I I played in Trinidad. Um, I, I played in 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 the U.S. at, at the college level. I, and I remember Mark McGee walking me out on, onto the uh, onto the Elm Park pitch when I first arrived. Um, again, this is on trial, not knowing how things would, would turn out. And I, I thought this was as good as it got. It, I thought that was as good a facility, as good a stadium as I'd played in. You know, I, I wasn't used to I wasn't used to stands that that held twelve thousand people. I didn't notice the the you know rusty infrastructure or whatever it may be. Here I was at a professional ground in England. The pitch was flat. It was entirely covered in grass. Even that was a, a luxury as compared <laughs> to, to some of the, some of the facilities I'd played my trade on growing up, and 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 including in in, in the US. I, I thought it was the best thing I'd seen. And, and here Mark McGee was making all these apologies, and I was in total awe. And that is how I remember Elm Park. And of course, as 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 my career went on, and I played not not only in in the second division and at, at the time um, with with Reading, and you realise that there were better facilities that other stadia, that other teams had had better facilities or better training grounds or whatever it may be. I still remember walking out into Elm Park with Mark McGee as a trialist and being totally in awe, and that that is how that is how I I, I remember Elm Park. And to put things in perspective, and you talk about first impressions. Now, by the time the Majeski Stadium, the new state-of-the-art facility had, had opened up, um, obviously I, I had moved on from, from Reading by which time I'd been playing in the Premier League. I'd become used to, I'd become used to these big, expansive stadiums, state-of-the-art stadiums. I, I remember playing at, at Elm Park and at, uh, at the Majeski Stadium, and it did not impress me the way wow. Elm Park did first time I, I, I appeared there. And that's that's how I remember Elm Park. So I, I I make no apologies or I don't buy into the, well, you know, what was it like stepping out into Elm Park with this rusty, dilapidated team? That, that's, that's not how I remember Elm Park at all. Yeah, I think I had the... Uh first impressions when I was sort of eight or nine walking onto the t onto the tireless end for the first time I thought this is massive this is huge I've never seen anything so big and then uh, yeah you slowly get to the other stadiums and realize uh, maybe it's not quite as good but um, I, but I remember we never forget but, yeah. you never forget that first impression not at all and that's why that's why you remain a, a, a fan of, of Reading Football Club whereas others might you know go off to to you know support other clubs that, that aren't local well, I'm, I'm not you know I'm, I'm not passing judgment on that but there is something magical about first impressions that never goes away. Absolutely. Well, as I said, you ended up signing for the club. You were fighting out with Steve Francis, I seem to remember, for the number one shirt. You got a run in the team at the start of that 92-93 season. But then um, you were out of the team. I can't remember off the top of my head um, if you were injured or if you were just dropped. But you didn't play at all that season. Was it difficult not playing every week? It, it was. Well, I came into the team. Um, I knew I was going to be number number two. Well, I, 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 at very best, Steve Francis was the number one. The reserve goalkeeper was a guy called Danny Honey. Um, he got injured in, in the reserves very early on in, in the reserves, which uh, afforded me the opportunity to play with Reading reserves even before I'd, I'd signed my first my first pro contract, and I was doing pretty well in, in the reserves. And then Steve Francis broke a finger playing playing for Reading, and that gave me an opportunity to play the first team. And um, I, I didn't enjoy it. I, you know, I, I was being I was thrown in at the deep end. 
I, I myself was, was struggling with, with niggling injuries for the first time in my life. I'd been training every day. I'd been training at an intensity that I'd never been used to with, with players that were every bit as, as, as good as me. I were, and in many cases, a, a whole lot better than, than I was. And it, it was a hard adjustment professionally. It was also a tough adjustment personally. As I mentioned, I'd left my, my, my family and, and my loved ones back in the States. I'd, plopped myself down in, in Reading. I, I knew nobody in the town. The closest friends I had, I had a couple of friends who lived in London. I would, I would get to see them uh, whenever I could, but even then, that, that wasn't often. So it, it was a tough it was a tough social adjustment, and, and it was tough on me professionally as well. And I, I didn't play well. And by the, time, uh, by the time Steve was fit again, Mark and Mark McGee and, and Colin Lee, his assistant, brought him back into the team um, and to be, to be quite honest, it was absolutely the right decision. I, I don't think I was, I, I don't think I was, I was doing myself or the team any justice. Well, you did get your way back into the team at the start of the next season, and then you never missed a game after that. You played solidly for the next two seasons um, as part of one of the best Reading sides of all time. Obviously, won Division Two in '93 and '94, and then in '94 '95, finishing second in Division One, the club's highest ever finish to that point. What made that team tick under Mark McGee? What turned it from a sort of mid-table-ish side in, in your first season there to one that just steamrolled their way through? Well, well, two things. And even now in my in my current job with, with ESPN here, here in the US, I always talk about the psychology of a team and the long-term psychology of a team. And I'm never one that buys into, you know, you have to do things in, in terms of the short term. So that being said, in, 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 in that in my second season at Reading, which would have been in 93-94 season, Steve Francis was sold to Huddersfield. And Mark called me into Mark called me into the office. Mark and Corin called me into the office and said, listen, we're selling Steve Francis. Um, we had to think about bringing in another goalkeeper to, to replace him. But we thought we'd give you the opportunity to prove yourself as number one. And that was huge for me. That that really was huge. Here was you had two coaches who were throwing their faith behind me. Um, and, and that made a, a huge difference to me and my own approach to, to that season, my own self-belief. Um, you know, quite possibly, in, in, in retrospect, it, it might have just been the case that they didn't have the money to bring in another goalkeeper. But, you know, here, as far as I was concerned at the time, I had two very accomplished coaches showing faith in me. And, and I did everything I could to repay that faith. So that season, whether I was playing well or playing badly, I would spend as much time as I could on the training ground. I would patch myself up through injuries to make sure and, and put myself out there every single weekend. Um, I was also the only goalkeeper on the books at the time. So it meant it meant a lot to me in terms of repaying repaying their faith in me. So that 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 was that was the first thing as far as I was concerned. And I, I think we finished eighth that season, if my research me correctly. Yeah. And then the second season, um, I think we I think we played our first game at home, and I think we won. And then I remember on the training ground on a Thursday before we were due to travel, we were due to travel. I, I can't remember where the second game was. Um, we were due to travel, and and Mark called it, called the whole team together on on, on the training ground. We used to train up at uh, up at uh, Coombe Park at, at the time, and. Um, and he just said, listen, I had a look at, at this team. I had a look at the league. And I made a decision. We're not going to adjust to the opposition. We're going to play our football. And we're going to let the opposition try to figure out how to stop us. And right there and right then, I felt we as a team believed that we could win this league. We, we, were, we were in the second division. And as you keep mentioning, the old second division which is now what League, League One. One, yeah, yeah. I, I keep losing track. <laughs> Me too. I, 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 I honestly believe that that Thursday, second th or, or the yeah, you went first, to, it was the was the first season of the game. Yeah, right there and right then, we we won the league right there, and 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 as I mentioned, Dan, we 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 ran away with it because all of a sudden we believed in ourselves and we believed we were the best team in the league and and. Mark McGee made us believe that that way, and 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 there was no stopping us. And and then to follow on from that psychology, 
we took that same psychology in into the next season, where of course we, we, we got promoted. Where okay, we had to be a little bit more tactically aware because we know we were in a higher league. Um, we were now in, in the first division, far better players. Everybody expected us to get relegated, but the, the self belief was well, the self belief remained. And you know, I mean, but for but for the Premier League wanting to reduce their numbers, we we would have been promoted. I was going to say, who were who were the players that really made those teams tick for you? Who did you think this is the guy that's driving us forward? What are your memories of the team you actually played in? Um, I, I think the personalities that, that really made us tick, Mick Gooding, um, without with, with, without without question, Kevin Dillon, uh, who, who was experienced, and and Kevin didn't play a whole lot. Kevin came in, um, especially in, in in that second season where. Where we finished second in, in yeah, he'd left the club in the summer, hadn't he? Um, I I thought Kevin was always a, a very calming influence on 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 the field and the training ground. Hugely experienced, um, and and was very good for the dressing room. Mick was a different personality. Nick was high energy. Mick was never say die. Mick Gooding simply he he wouldn't he wouldn't allow allow this team to ever feel defeated. And, you know, we, we'll, we can talk till we're blue in the face and, and we can reminisce about Jimmy Quinn's goals and um, Michael Jilts down and, and Dylan Kerr down the left-hand side and Archie Lovell and, and how complete a striker he was and, and Darius Vjocek as, as good a defender as he was. Um, we can go on and on and on about that team, but I feel the, the two biggest the two biggest influences in, in, in that team came in, in, in Mick Gooding and Kevin Dillon, who players who, who probably will never grab a headline. Yeah, Mick Gooding still still trying to make headlines. He's uh, working for BBC Radio Berkshire every weekend. He's, he does the, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the colour comms. Yeah, I, yeah I, 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 I'd probably not changed in the slightest no, in, this time. No, he's very much the same. As much of a terry up in the comm box as he uh, was on the pitch. But, I mean, that second season where we did finish second, it, it looked like it was all going so well. And then Mark McGee walks out. Colin Lee walks out for Leicester. Mm. Did you think that the season was going to fall away at that point? Did or, and do you think that maybe if Mark and Colin had stayed, you would have nabbed that top spot? No, I, I, I don't. And and, and I, I think um, Mick and, and Jimmy Quinn, who came in and took the reins, did, did a good job. But but like I said, I, I felt the foundations were laid for that team, you know, two seasons before, uh, as I mentioned. So that their walking out was a bit of a blow, yes. And um, certainly when they walked out, there was a lot of speculation that I would be joining them at Leicester. That that was... If, if that was going to happen, it was going to be at the end of the season. I wasn't going to do it at, at, at that point. You know, this team had been playing too well. We had been promising far too much up, up to that point. I, I wasn't... I had no intention of, of leaving then. Um, you know, who knows what, what would have happened at, at the end of the season. But the foundations were there. And, and, and it was just a matter of keeping us on, on those tracks, which which I think we did, um, which I, I, I think J Jimmy and, 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 and Mick did. Um, I felt there was enough of an understanding between the dressing room and the you now player player managers that if things weren't right or that we could we could approach them with, with any concerns. Um, I, I didn't have, I, I didn't share those concerns that it was all going to come apart at the seams when, when, uh, when, when, when Colin and, and Mark left. No, and you carried on that form. Obviously, you were voted player of the season that year. You got all the way to Wembley, got through the playoffs. It was a fantastic win up at Tranmere. Still one of my favourite ever away days. And then held on in the second leg, that nil-nil. Got to Wembley. We all know, unfortunately, what happened. Um, how, how, how did you see it? How did you see that game go from, I said, 2-0 up? Was it all just down to Archie missing that penalty? Or was it already a case of Bolton were coming back? No, well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. I, and I, actually, I was, I was thinking about this a couple of weeks ago, the nil-nil at Tranmere at, at, at Town Park. I, I don't think there's ever been a better nil-nil. I've ever played a better nil-nil <laughs> in my life. That, that, I mean, we did the hard work. We did the hard work of a Tranmere. And I remember playing at Town Park and thinking, right, we just not, we're not going to concede. And I remember the fans 
did not stop singing all game long. It was the best atmosphere for a nil-nil anybody has ever seen anywhere. We, ever. Were, we were packed in. I remember we even had half of the away, the old town in. We had That's, half of that. And did not stop singing. This no. was a nil-nil. This was a nil-nil where we were like, you have to... We, did we win 3-0 up three one. Up at uh, three three one. One. Yeah, we took 3-1. Up three at one. Me, I was yeah. like, right. Whatever happens, we are not going to concede. And it and the fans did not. I've never seen an atmosphere for it in, in a in a nil nil ball draw as as it will. But anyway, and then moving on, moving on to to Wembley. I again maybe and and actually I try telling my kids this now. I have never ever criticized someone um, for missing a penalty. Never because I I do not have the backbone to to step up there with everything on the line even from 12 yards out. I'm quite comfortable being in goal and, and, and trying to stop it. I'm, I'm, I, I do not envy the, the guy on the other side of the, of the penalty spot, as, as it were. But if, maybe if that penalty were earlier in the half or in the middle of the second half, um, psychologically, it would have been different. But for it to come right before the break, as it did, you just fear that there were, you felt the momentum shift. From from both our sides and and from Bolton and, and especially from Bolton. I mean, we we go into the break two up and and you know we, we're feeling good about it. And now Bolton are looking for something, anything to to hold on to, um, in in terms of you know they could get themselves back into it. And and missing the penalty right before the break, I think was was exactly that. For instance. If Archie had missed that penalty when it was 1-0 and then we went on and scored a second in the first half and, and went into the break exactly the same, 2-0 with a missed penalty, no question, we, in my mind, we would have gone on and, and, and you know, completed the job. Had, had Archie missed that penalty in the middle of the second half, no question, in my mind, we would have gone on and, and, and completed the job. But I'm a big, as I keep saying, I'm a big proponent of, of psych, the psychology in the game or um, as... as you know, a lot of people here in the US refer to it as the game within the game. And and I feel right before the break and can kinda of hurt us. Or certainly it, it it gave it gave Bolton the, the boost that um that they needed. And and let's be honest, Bolton were a bigger club, spent more money, had better players. We just had a we just had a better dressing room. We just had a, a, a better self belief. And eventually as as you know, their quality just kind of told in, in the end and, and wore a stone still still feel jason mcateer should have been sent off for the foul on jilksy still think he should have got a red yeah and and to be quite honest i i still think i should have seen the, was it the first goal from the free to us I, I i i thought i could have dealt with that better but anyway the only other bit of trivia from that game which which i always liked was was your goalkeeping kit that day there's a story <laughs> behind it just out of nowhere you're wearing this funky yellow design with some blue arrows and stuff i'll try and put up a picture when i put up this um put up this episode on the show to see people show people what it was like how did that all come about because it just seemed to come out of nowhere it, it and and it did uh, um they just brought in some new kits for for the for the game and um is it right that you had a hand in designing it it's aware and that was it i don't think i've ever worn that kit before no, because I, 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 there was there was a, an urban sort of myth going around that you actually had a hand in designing it. That's not the case, then. No, 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 no. I, I no, I, I do not have a creative board in my <laughs> but I, I, I wouldn't even think about getting involved in that in that at all. Okay. And, and uh, judging from some of the kits I've worn, quite clearly, <laughs> I wear anything you give me to wear. That uh, that Newcastle number the next season was uh, a funky <laughs> one as well. That purple one. Um, so um, speaking of Newcastle, then, so we lose the playoff final. The, the team's broken up. Did you? At what point did you decide it's time for me to move on? Was it immediately after that, or was it once a club came in for you, or had you already sort of made your mind up? It's time for me to move on because obviously you'd spent two and a half years there as your first British club. I mean, mm -hmm. what was it tough to leave Reading? It, it, it was, but then you know when when you consider who came calling, um, you know it, I couldn't turn my back on on that opportunity either. And you know at, at the time of the playoffs, there was a lot of speculation that clubs were interested and um, and and what what may lie ahead uh, for for me professionally. But I, I'd had no official contact from anyone. Um, I all I all I knew was what I read in the papers, just as much as 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 everybody else did. Um, and I was just waiting to see. And then, um, so that, that's, that's summer of 95. 
I, I got married in, 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 in 95. Um, so went back to Sri Lanka Tobago for that. And then came up and, you know, went straight into, went straight into pre-season. So I, I'd actually pretty much switched off from, you know, what, what happened and had to move on quickly for obvious reasons. And then when it, we came back up to pre-season, it's only when we went out to Ireland. We went out to Ireland on a pre-season tour. And um, I started getting calls from, from my agent at the time saying that Newcastle were very interested. They were about to table a bid. And that's when it became very real. And that's when, you know, especially when, when you think of, of, you know, the team that Newcastle were building at the time, Kevin Keegan in charge. Um, they just signed Lance Ferdinand, Warren Barton, David Ginola. Um, I, I couldn't take my back on, on on that opportunity, and, and um, once that once that interest had had, had been confirmed and, and and a bid was a bid was was placed, things kind of came together quickly after that. I was going to say, no one obviously blame me for taking that move, but was it a case? Did Reading did Reading want to keep you, or was it a case of they look, did. it's a lot of money, we we need to take this money? They did, they they did they they did make me another uh, an offer, an increased offer on on. On uh, on the salary that I was on, um, just to put things in, in perspective. Now, let's see. My, my my first contract, I was on twenty grand a year. I was on a full four hundred pounds a week. Wow. Yeah. So then, at, I at think the Lionel end, Messi's made that in the time we've been speaking. The, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I, I signed a new contract in. So my first contract was for two years, ninety two through ninety four. So I signed a new contract um, when we got promoted and, and and were playing in in the first division. And that was for that was for a hefty sixty grand a year. Um, and then Reading offered me, I, I, I think I'm right in saying that they offered to 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 double or or triple my wages. I I, I can't remember. I, I can't remember if it was, if it was to one twenty or to one eighty, but it was somewhere around there. So it's still around two three grand a week, which today would seem nothing. Exactly, exactly, which is exactly my, my point, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, but but that was, and, and even then, that was a, I was that was a lot of money. I was very tempted by it, but um, and, and to be quite honest, I signed for Newcastle for not not a whole lot more. But the opportunity to play in the Premier League with a team like Newcastle, who I, I felt would be would be uh, challenging for for Premier League title honours, uh, was too much for me to turn my back on. So you went on to Newcastle and moved around a couple of times after that to West Ham, to Portsmouth, back to West Ham mm -hmm. um, and whatnot. You did end up coming and playing against Reading a couple of times towards the sort of end of your career as well. I remember you coming back in 2001. I think it might have even been on September the 11th. It was. For the League Cup game. And I remember you getting a, a really good reception. Um, there was some good banter with the South -est, southeast end of the stand. I mean, what do you remember? Obviously a very emotional night for everyone playing, but what was it like coming back especially to face your old club on a night like that it, it, it really was special and and well the the magnitude of, of the day itself uh, and, and what was happening in, in in new york i i never realized uh we we arrived at, at, at the hotel the the you know the, the morning i guess just as uh our, well before anything was happening and then you know we had our pre-match meal um and, and more um, my my Routine from then would be to go up to my room and and, and have a sleep and um, you know just get ready for the game. I you know didn't have the telly on, didn't have the news on, so woke up, switched my switch my phone on, and a friend called to tell me about. Actually, at, at the time, the first call I got only the only the first plane had hit. Um, so I, at that point, everybody's still speculating that that it was an accident, but. After that, I switched my phone off because now, you know, it's, you know, two or three hours before the game and my focus is, is firmly on the game. And good friend of mine with the national team, Tony Roger, was playing as well. So that was, um, that, that was also, you know, added spice for, for, for that game. And then, you know, the banter with, with the fans, absolutely fantastic. I was delighted I was able to, to come back um, and, and play, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been back and, and visited and watched games, etc. But to be on the field, it, it was great to be there. And I think I'm right in saying that that game finished as, as a nil-nil and then Reading won in penalties. Yeah, but yeah, um, but yeah it, it really was a special night. And then, and then, as you say, you go from a kind of emotional high or the emotional high of, of that situation, for me personally, um, and then to realise what had been happening elsewhere kind of brought 
throw things down with a bump. Absolutely. Um, before we, I was going to ask you a couple of questions on your international career, but before we leave the club side behind, uh, you know, you had some fantastic times, obviously winning promotion with Reading and, and getting some good finishes in the league. I think you won promotion with Portsmouth as well. But mm -hmm. you had a, a series of, of heartbreaks as well. And we had a, one question from one of our editors and he said, what was more heartbreaking for you? Losing that playoff in 95, seeing that 12 point lead with Newcastle evaporate the following season or right at the end of your club career, losing that Gerrard final, that 2006 FA Cup final, which of the three stung the most? Jeez, I, I, I'll tell you what, it's probably probably the, the Gerard goal in, in 2006. Because I, as it turned out, that was my final act in, in English football. Um, and and I, I made this joke um, kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I, I played in England for 14 years um, and represented Trinidad and Tobago for, well, or on, I think, 25 official occasions. I mean, I had a long sabbatical for reasons I won't get into. But anyway, so the, my last game in English football was was that 2006 FA Cup final. And straight from that from that FA Cup final, I went to join the Trinidad Tobago national team. We went to the World Cup. First game in the World Cup was was uh, Sweden, Sweden, was it? Yeah. Sweden nil nil, which you know a, a lot of people remember. The second game um, was against England. Uh, Peter Crouch scored in the 83rd and then Stephen, Stephen Gerrard scored in, in, in injury time at the end of the game. And, and, and there was some controversy around the Peter Crouch goal with the pulling of Brent Sancho's hair. And for a career that lasted 14 years in, in England at both club and international level, I'm remembered for two games, the 2006 Epic, <laughs> Epic final and, and, and Peter Crouch pulling Brent Sancho's here for England to get to get the better of Trent to begin in the 2006 World Cup. Uh, so that kind of sums it up. But so anyway, to answer the, the the question is is 2006 just because at least you know that that was the end. And I knew I knew at that point that I, well I didn't think I was going to come back to English football. I planned to to, to move out to the US and was, was trying to was was trying to do that deal at, at at the time. And so I knew that that was kind of my last hurrah in English football, as it were, you know, losing losing at Wembley in 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 '95. This was pretty much at the start of my career, and I felt, you know, had everything in, in front of me. Um, the following season, we that 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 lead dissipated. But again, this is very early on in my career, and I feel that there's so much there there was so much more to come, or there was opportunities to put it to put that right to to write to write the records. In 2006, I knew I knew I was about to to leave English football, um, and, and there was at that point nothing nothing I could do about it. Yeah, well, as as you mentioned, you played um, 25 odd times for your country. Um, didn't play more because of you know at one point you had declared yourself for England and then didn't. Do, do you regret not playing more international football? Uh, no, not not really, and and. Um, the big story be behind um, that sabbatical, as, as I mentioned, was Jack Warner. No, who now everybody's kind of understanding. Um, Not a very nice character. Uh, yeah, ex everybody's understanding the issues that I faced. Jack Warner and and I um, did not see eye to eye for for want of of a, of a stronger expression. Um, and, and I decided um, I, I wasn't going to go back and, and play un, under under those conditions. And I, I didn't want to go back and play um, while he felt that he could strong arm my, my career. Um, in the end, I realized that, you know, I, I wanted to play for Trent to be. It, 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 you know, this is what I, it, it was. It was a calling of mine. And, and um, so in the end, I, I kind of had to bury the hatchet and, and swallow some of my self-pride to at least realize that that ambition of of, of mine and and um which which is why I, I did go back when i did and i felt it was at a point where jack warner could not have the influence that that he was he was trying to you know jack warner tried to have me banned when i was playing for reading because i didn't want to come back for a meaningless friendly that was outside of a of a fifa window um jack warner tried to manipulate my career at one point when i was playing for reading um, I I called the the Trinidad Football Association and said, 
Um, I am happy doing what I'm doing. I have a contract. I'm insured as, as a player, but the local players in Trinidad and Tobago weren't. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to make sure that they had insurance. He sold that to, to the local media in Trinidad and Tobago that my demands were too high. And I, of course, was was chastised for that. And, and so it's just a, a lot of, you know, naughtiness around around what he what he and I went through at the time that that didn't rub me well at all. But as I say, in the end, I swallowed self pride just to realize a, a personal ambition. So I have no regrets for, for not going back when I did. I, I believe that my stand was right um, and, and I, I, I Given the choice to, to do it all all over again, I absolutely will. Well, the thing is as well, it wasn't just that, that you know you decided not to play. You were actually really close to the English squad. I think you got sort of in and around the English squad. I think you played a game for the under 21s. Did you feel you had a realistic chance? Because England were going through a bit of a you know David Seaman was there, but there wasn't really a clear sort of hierarchy yeah, at the time. I did actually. Um, I, I played for I played for England Bees. Um, actually, I was on the bench for an, an England international. Uh, Tim Flowers played, no, Nigel Martin played against Chile um, for a full international. I think that, I think that might have been in 98, um, is it late 97? Or, or, I, I'm pretty sure it was early 1998. Um, England played played Chile in, in, in a friendly, I was on the bench for that. Later on, um, the under-21s, I played as, a, as an overage player for, for England under-21s against Switzerland. I uh, had a horrific game, right, <laughs> as it happens. Um, and then, actually, that summer, Kevin Keegan asked me for, well, wanted to name me as, as, as in the England squad for, I, I think, um, it might have been Euro qualifiers, now that, now that I think about it. Um, maybe for the, for the Euro qualifiers, no, it would have been... The following summer, so summer of '99. Yeah, um, so it would have been for Euro 2000, the qualifiers. Correct. For that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you want to name in, in the squad for and and you know, so as as they always do, they they, they call and, and let the players know beforehand that they'd be part of the squad. And I declined the invitation because I I made up my mind that I was going to, as 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 I said, kind of look past the the, the problems, the personal issues between myself and and, and Jack Warner, and go back to represent Trinidad Tobago. So I turn that down. Um, that of course we, you know, no one ever. ever I, I, I certainly never spoke about it in the media, and and know that, uh, know that Kevin. Absolutely not. Well, as I said, you know, you went on, you played in a World Cup, so I don't think, you know, and that's something that that will always stick with you. I said I remember you watching that, and as a Reading fan, full of pride, um, seeing you line up in that game, it was fantastic. You know, in, you know, obviously wanting England to win, but wanted you to have an absolute blinder, and he didn't do didn't do yourself any any harm whatsoever <laughs> so sort of went out at, at the sort of the very top at international level but obviously giving us a lot of your time i'm gonna gonna let you go soon but just gonna ask a few quick fire questions for no you problem. first one what was your your best reading game you you know you mentioned the atmosphere in that neon game but what was your best Ooh. performance um my best performance for reading i i have no idea i cannot think I can't think of, of one individual game that 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 stands out. In, in all honesty, I or, really or a favourite game then you played in the, maybe the team one or what a game where you just oh, thought that was my favourite, favourite game was that nil nil against <laughs> with no question it it was it, it was the best atmosphere I think I, I've ever played in certainly at at uh, at Elm Park that that Brighton the game where we sealed promotion as well the season before that must have been great with the with the pitch invasion and Correct, lifting was. the title. That's right. That's right. And we had some special time. We had some special time. Excellent. Any game that you you just wish that a hole had opened up in the penalty area and swallowed you? Oh, uh, more more than more than a few. Um, again for Reading, I, I can't think of any for Reading. Um, but there 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 were a ton. I mean, for Newcastle, for West Ham. Um, I can't I can't think of any for 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 Portsmouth per se. Um, Sydney, Newcastle, and, and West Ham. I, I, I had some days that I, I just wish that I, I, I could have back. But I kind of, you kind of learn that. Listen, if you want to stay long in this game, you you just have to put yourself back out there and uh, dig yourself out of that hole somehow. But yeah, I don't want to relive those right now. Absolutely. Your favorite ground you played in? My my favorite ground Anfield, and I've never played for Liverpool, and I've always enjoyed visiting every single time I visited Anfield and I played there in one of those famous slash infamous four, four threes, threes yeah 
against Liverpool. And I always loved playing at Anfield. I, I thought the fans there were, were special. Um, the best manager you played under? Best manager played under Leo Benaka for the Trinidad and Tobago national team when he was the one who was the architect behind our, our qualifying for the 2006 World Cup. And I feel, I, I, I maintain to this day, best, best manager I've played under. Finally, in the quick fire round, Sir John Medeski celebrated 25 years as chairman or since he took invo- took involvement in the club recently. He led the teams out onto the pitch against QPI the other day. Have you got any Sir John stories to share with us? Not not a whole lot. I remember going to his house and him showing us his his new Jaguar XJ220 when that when that first came out. Um, you know, I, 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 he was a man that kept himself to himself. What, what, I tell you what, one of the things that kind of always struck me as uh, that, I, that I remember was he was very good friends with who was that? Yuri the, Geller. Yuri Geller. And I remember what before one game, um, Mark McGee is trying to give his team talk, and in walks John Majeski with Yuri Geller, and Yuri Geller proceeds to bend spoons in the dressing room <laughs> and talk about the men about how strong your mind is and whatnot, and left poor Mark McGee with no time left in his team talk, and everybody in the dressing room just looking around at each other and wondering what on earth just happened here. It was so funny, and I, I've, I've never forgotten that in my entire life. I always remember that. I have to ask you as well, you know, you mentioned it was a, a tough social adjustment coming over to England. So any memories of, of certain establishments in Reading that you frequented, uh, the name Utopia frequently comes up amongst the ex-players when they're talking on the yeah, radio these yeah. days. Uh, I've, I've had my fair nights, my fair share of nights in Utopia. That's that's right. I will say no more than that, it's, Dan. It's going to be in Ikea now. They've knocked it down. Have they? Yeah, it's gone. It's just, it Long just won't gone. be the same. It's, it's just something about... I, I I can't go there and and, and buy a and buy a <laughs> DIY sofa. It, it, you can't buy a, a, a DIY sofa in Utopia. It can't be done. Yeah. It's just not right. Absolutely not. And just very finally, then before you go, um, tell us tell us what you're up to now. Um, obviously working in the media. What's your sort of day to day and week to week life like now? Oh, well, as I mentioned before, I'm working for ESPN out here in the US. So so covering still covering the game at the highest level. Um, including the Premier League, but all, all the major leagues across Europe and, and some of the bigger ones on, on this side of the pond as well. Um, we do a show that goes out here in the US. We're on in the Caribbean, in Asia, in Australia. We're also on in, in the UK on BT Sport. It goes out six days a week. I'm generally on there three or four times a week. Um, and, and that's what I'm doing. And uh, that's my... That's my, my full-time job so between that and and five kids at home now well four kids at home my, my eldest is, is at university out in england um any, uh, any of them likely else? to follow in your footsteps well my, my eldest two my, my eldest dances and as i say she's out in england my second daughter does gymnastics uh, and then the, my youngest three, they all play they all play football themselves. So um, four girls and a boy. The youngest is a boy. So I have two girls who are playing football and, and my little man is also playing as well. Um, and we'll see. Right now, I ask no more of them than my dad did of me, which is just enjoy the game um, and, and have fun with it. You get as friendly. long as they do that, I'm, I am. I'm very happy with 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 with, uh, with their continued involvement. I was going to say, you're good friends as well with Brian Lara. I don't suppose they've tried to uh, tempt tempt him with a bit of cricket. Were you ever tempted? I played cricket with Brian growing up, and and actually Brian played in a Brian played in a couple of national football teams under 12 and under 14, I believe. He might have even played under 16 national football with, with me growing up. But then you know at that age, around 15 or 16. You have to, you know, you have to pick one sport or, or, or the other. You know, you, at that point, you, you can it gets it starts getting a lot more serious. And he went off to, to cricket. Uh, he went off to cricket. I, I stopped playing cricket and focused focused on football. Um, but yeah, but that that was as 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 far as my own uh, cricketing cricketing career went. 
Uh, well, that's uh, I don't think I don't think you picked too badly considering where you ended up. And then, Nor did he actually? <laughs> no, I, he did all right. He was okay. He could you know he could b- <laughs> bat a little bit. Um, very final question then before I do let go. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Then you obviously do keep an eye on football and the results. How do you see Reading at the moment? Obviously back in the Championship. Uh, we've just sacked Steve Clark. As we're recording this, it looks like Brian McDermott's going to get the job back. Although this is going to go out in a week or so, so we could be horrifically wrong. But what do you make of the club in general and where it stands now and, and what you sort of think the potential is for it? Well, I, I think the club has a very good infrastructure and, and that, that hasn't changed. And, and um, speaking of how, not, not changing, I was looking at the, at the Reading QPR game on um, uh, recently and, and John Medeski himself hasn't, hasn't changed a bit, has he? Um, but anyway... Um, but I, I think there, there's some issues there for, for Reading to address, a lack of scoring. But the infrastructure remains strong. And, and um, I, I, I expect to see Reading back in the Premier League or Sydney challenging at the, at the, top, at the top of the championship before long. Um, but, but you just wonder if how, how difficult it is um, for, for a club like Reading to, to maintain themselves, to, to, to have any level of consistency in the Premier League, you know, it's such a competitive league, as is the Championship, um, and little room for error. Um, so, despite the infrastructure being being very good at Reading, um, I, I I don't know if if I'll see a a point where Reading, uh, a Premier League club, challenging at the top without any real fear of of uh, of going back down. I I, I just wonder if they become one of those yo-yo clubs between the championship and and and, and the Premier League. I, I don't see them as being a club that that belongs any lower than the championship. Well fingers crossed I said it would be uh, it'd be great to get a win back promotion to the Premier League. I know our new tone has got grand ambitious plans for the club but so have half a dozen others so we'll have to see where it goes. But Shaka Thank you very, very much indeed for giving us your time. Great to hear you doing well and great to hear some of those stories um, about Elm Park and, and things like that. Where can we where can we follow you on social media? Where can we get our Shaka fix? Uh, on, on Twitter, at Shaka Hislop, as simple as you like. I don't tweet a lot. I'll be honest with you, Dan, I'm not a huge social media fan. Um, it is I, a jungle out there. It, it is a jungle. Um, and I... I I don't. Uh, I, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I I don't do any other social media apart from that. So that that's about as good as as it gets as for me in in uh, in this new age of of uh, of all inclusive social media. I can't say I blame you on a bit, but Shaka, I said thank you very much. Have a fantastic day, a great Christmas, and uh, maybe we'll catch up one day soon. Hopefully, we'll see you back at the Medeski one day. I'm 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 sure you will, and hopefully before long. Merry Christmas to you and everyone out there. Get social with the boys. Find them on Twitter at the Tarhurst End and Facebook.com forward slash the Tarhurst End.